The following message by Alistair Begg is made available by Truth For Life. For more information, visit us online at truthforlife.org. Father, thank you that in Jesus, death's dark night is overcome. And we pray that as we turn to the Bible, you will teach us about this immense truth in order that our lives might be touched and changed, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we read part of Psalm 90. I'd like to read the balance of it. If you turn there again, Psalm 90 and verse beginning at the ninth verse. For all our days, writes Moses, pass away under your wrath. We bring our years to an end like a sigh. The years of our life are 70, or even by reason of strength, 80. Yet their span is but toil and trouble. They are soon gone, and we fly away. Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? So teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long? Have pity on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, and for as many years as we have seen evil. Let your work be shown to your servants, and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Amen. I've asked uh, for a couple of uh, pictures just to be put on the screen. Uh, to set uh, the context for our reading of this 90th Psalm. And uh, this is as a result of my travels. You say, well, you must be feeling rather morbid or something. No, not at all. I told you that I visit cemeteries. And this was uh, in suburban Philadelphia about 10 days ago. And I was thinking about how quickly life passes and have been pondering it ever since, and want to address it with you this morning. The writer of Ecclesiastes says, it is better to go to a funeral than a party, because the living should always remind themselves that death is waiting for us all. The living should always remind themselves. That, incidentally, is one of the reasons to have a graveyard in the property of a church so that as the people routinely come to that church building, it's virtually impossible for them not to be confronted by their mortality, to be reminded that someone, a loved one or a friend, is there, their earthly remains laid down in that ground, and that one day they too will be, if Christ does not return to take them first. So, as we think along these lines, we have to be honest and say, Quite honestly, it is the case that we, by and large, seek to avoid any thought of death at all, and particularly any notion of the prospect of our own death. It is, by definition, impossible for us, actually, to imagine our own death, because the only way we can do it is while we're alive. So you can't imagine being dead without being dead, and then you couldn't imagine it at all. So it is a fact that has to be faced. And face it, everyone eventually does. The point of Psalm 90 is that it is supposed to be faced by those who are living. Christopher Hitchin, uh, my favorite uh, atheist of old, the late Christopher Hitchin, uh, tells of how he, unlike other men, uh, discovered the reality of mortality not with the death of his father, which people often say, when my father died, then I realized that my name was next on the list. Now, um, Hitchin says, quoting him, unfilial as this may seem, that was not at all so in my case. It was only when I watched my son being born that I knew at once that my own funeral director had very suddenly, but quite unmistakably, stepped onto the stage. I was surprised by how calmly I took this, but also how reluctant I was to mention it. So here's the question. Why do we have to die at all? And why 
does the prospect come around so quickly? Now, the 90th Psalm is not unique in this respect. It's part of a larger body, but nevertheless, it helps us answer that question and uh, with a very, very solid answer. It is routinely a funeral psalm. I acknowledge that in the Anglican prayer book. It is one of the required readings along with the uh, 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. And often when it is read, and you will perhaps have heard it read, it is read in such a way that the difficult parts are, are, are removed by the minister or the, 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 the pastor or the vicar. And uh, so, for example, uh, they will read, you sweep men away as with a flood and a dream and so on, and the poetry of us all there. And then it drops down, the years of our life are 70 or even by strength, 80. And what it skips out is, we are brought to an end by your anger, by your wrath, we are dismayed. And so, hoping to try and, as it were, was a strange thought, isn't it? To try and clean the psalm up, you know, for the average 21st century uh, listener or participant. Uh, the psalm is then actually, the message of it is not simply obscured, it is completely destroyed. Uh, the very, uh, often when you read the Bible, and perhaps you're wondering about the Bible, and you've only begun to read it, and you're tempted to say, well, I've got to read only the parts that aren't the difficult parts. The difficult parts are all the necessary parts. The difficult parts are all the good parts. It is in those parts that you will find the greatest answers. And so, I think this morning you'll find that. What I want to do is just trace a line through this psalm. If your Bible is open, you will notice that it is a prayer of Moses, the man of God. So, we know who wrote it. Moses, who led the people out of Egypt, who led them in the wilderness, has penned this psalm somewhere along that journey. And he begins addressing God as the eternal and unchanging, immortal God. It's a wonderful beginning. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Now, think of that for just a moment. They had no dwelling place, did they? They had come out of Egypt. They were wandering in the wilderness. They were in a kind of tented facility. They were migrants. They were moving about here and there. They had the symbol of the presence of God uh, among them in their camp. And so Moses says, we want to affirm the fact that you actually are our dwelling place. And if you are a believer today, God is your dwelling place. Colossians 3, your life is hid with Christ in God. Our citizenship is is in heaven, and from there we await a Savior, and so on. So that our true identity, as we've been seeing in Ephesians, is that we have actually been lifted up and raised into the heavenly realms in Christ. And Moses is anticipating all of the fullness of that when he gave his blessing to his people before he died. And you can read it in Deuteronomy 33. Uh, one of the parts of the blessing is to say to them, the eternal God is your dwelling place, and underneath are the everlasting arms. They're inevitably saying, well, what's going to happen now when Moses, the man of God, is taken away? He says, I want to commend you to God who is the everlasting God. He is the dwelling place through all generations. It's not going to end at this moment. It was so before, and it will be so afterwards. Now, this is what the Bible says. And man, that is, men and women, in our rebellion against God, push back on what the Bible says. The Bible says that the things that are um, evidences of God, both as creator and as the sustainer of the universe, are clearly seen and uh, men recognize them because he has shown it to them. But although they are clearly perceived, and man is without excuse, although, and I'm quoting Paul now, although they knew God, i.e. they knew that God existed and that he created the universe, and so do you, ever since the creation of the world, these things were there. They knew God. They didn't honor him as God. They didn't give thanks to him. They became futile in their thinking. Their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be really bright, they became foolish. 
And he exchanged the glory of the immortal God, that is, the, the God who is our dwelling place through all generations. They exchanged that for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And so that even today, and you can just go right out here, go to blossom time, and you, and you will see sort of 21st century evidences of the fact that man has decided that God's revelation of himself, although it is undeniable, is unacceptable, and what is far more acceptable is to believe what I want to believe and to apply my mind to it in that way. Well, it doesn't alter the fact. So, God is immortal. Before the mountains were brought forth, I was reading just yesterday, I think I was reading out loud to Sue, I'm not sure she was listening, but I was reading about Stonehenge and, and, and how old Stonehenge is. And some of the in the book said, you know, people used to believe that Stonehenge was like 1,400 years old, but now we know that it is, you know, like 14 million years old or whatever crazy thing it was. Well, I said, I said out loud, I said, who says? Who says? And even so, you can do without whatever you want, but let me tell you what. Before Stonehenge, before the mountains were brought forth, before you had ever formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you alone are God. That's the foundational piece. That's where it starts. That's why Calvin says, this is where man must start. We are tempted to begin with ourselves and then extrapolate to divinity. Calvin says, no, it is when we descend from a devout musing upon the Godhead that we then are able to understand ourselves and why we were made and to what purpose. Well, that is how Moses starts. God, you are immortal. Second point, we are not. You are, we are not. Look at verse 3. You return man to dust, to dust. That's why in the funeral service, in the words of committal, the minister will eventually say, and we now commit the body of our dear brother to the ground, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. It is a reference to the early chapters of Genesis. On the day that you eat of this, you will surely die, and you will return to dust. People push back on this. And yet they, I see them because they tell me, I won't be here for a few days because I'm taking um, uh, my, my loved one, you know, to the Poconos or, or wherever it is. Why, why are they going there? Well, I'm going to scatter them there. S scatter what there? Oh, you mean scatter them like Psalm 90, verse 3? I get it. And people who actually want to deny the reality of things, carry with them the very evidences of the truthfulness of the Scriptures. From dust you came, and to dust you will return. And so he takes these metaphors, you see? You sweep them away as with a flood. What happens? It's like you're just swept away on a flood. Or like a dream. Did I dream? Did I dream just now, or was that last night? It was here and it was gone. The grass that looked so fresh and bright in the springtime looks so withered and dry now. These are all the pictures. Isaac Watts, the hymn writer, picked them up and put them in his hymn, O oh God, our help in ages past. And that's why when we sing the words, time like an ever-rolling stream bears all its sons away, we're actually singing a paraphrase of Psalm 90, and verse 5, even if we were to live for a thousand years, if you just let your eye go down, even if we were to live for a thousand years, then it's nothing. Because a thousand years is as a day in relationship to God. It's like somebody who has tons and tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of money. A hundred-dollar bill is nothing in comparison to all of that cash. Now, if you live to be a thousand, then that would be like three hours in God's time, 40 winks. And here's the deal. 
You're not going to live to be a thousand, and neither am I. So if you live to be 70 or maybe 80, it isn't even five minutes. That's a life. Gone. Now, why does the psalmist do this? Is this some kind of morbid introspection? Is, he just, is Moses just been having a really bad day and wants to just give everybody else a bad day? No, he is doing under the direction of God's Spirit himself that which is necessary in order to bring foolish humanity to its senses. It runs the whole way through the Bible. Elsewhere in the Psalms, he says, show me, tell me how fleeting I am. My days are faster, says the prophet, than a weaver's shuttle. James says, my life is like a morning mist. It appears for a little while and then vanishes away. No, we can't escape this. Verse 10, the years of our life are 70 or even by reason of strength, 80. 80. Now, you just, some of you are actuarial people. You're in the insurance industry. You, you use these actuarial tables. Now, and we know that life expectancy is different in the Western world than it was 50 years or 100 years ago. But by and large, it's sure not pushing the limits, isn't it? And our attempt to say that 70 is the new 50 is just part of our ability to try and push it back as far as we can because we don't like the numbers getting that close. We don't like walking through the cemetery now because the dates seem to be catching up with us. It used to be easy. You would say, oh, look at that. I can't imagine. Somebody was born in 1927. Now they were born in 1949, 1951, 1952. Whoa, this is a little too close for comfort. And that's exactly what it's supposed to be. Death has not yet reached you, but let it shake the chains, rattle you, confront you, wound you in order to heal you, scare you in order to grant you security. You see, the very thing that we want to run away from, I, I mean, I, when, when McCartney and Lennon recorded When I'm 64, I was 14. That's 50 years ago. I'm amazed that I can even remember something that happened 50 years ago. Well, it's just indicating what it is. Can you imagine as years from today, sharing a park bench quietly? How terribly strange to be 70, like an old friend. You're staring it in the face bag, and so are you. Now, why do we have to die? Why? From whence cometh death? The atheist has no answer. The secularist has no explanation. The Bible has the answer. It's right here in verse 7. We are brought to an end by your anger, and by your wrath we are dismayed. What is he saying? He's saying that death is the punishment for man's rebellion. Remember in the garden, you mustn't do this, but in the day you do, you will definitely die. And death enters into the world through sin. And you don't need to simply stay in Psalm 90. Read the rest of your Bible. Read what Paul has to say, for example, in Romans chapter 5. Now, before recoiling from this, think it out. God, who is perfect, immutable, eternal, perfect in his justice, perfect in his wisdom, is not indifferent to man's rebellion. You don't want an indifferent God. You don't want to play golf with someone who says there are no rules. You don't want cardiothoracic surgery from somebody who says, hey, what's an artery between friends? <laughs> you want to make sure that that person knows what's in and knows what's out. Therefore, how could it possibly be that the eternal, perfect creator of the universe would then say, oh, your rebellion doesn't matter. It matters. And he dealt with it. And in the flood, he dealt with it. 
And in banishing them from the garden, he dealt with it. And in the flood, he provided a way of escape. And in banishing them from the garden, he provided them clothing and covering for their nakedness, all ultimately pointing to the fact that death is dealt with in the provision of God's perfect Son. So God's settled reaction to man's rebellion has brought death into the world, and that notion is challenged, as we saw in Romans 1, not just by people in the street, but it's also challenged by pastors in, the, in their pulpits. Many a man who is apparently a teacher of the Bible does not really believe this stuff. I say it to, to the shame of it all. But if we're going to hold to the Bible, we have to believe in it. The indignation of God is seen in the frustration and in the envy and in the decay and in the transience of our lives. If we live for 80 years, if you go into extra time, as the FA Cup final did yesterday, although many of you won't care about that, but nevertheless, Manchester United won in extra time yesterday afternoon. There are 90 minutes, and then it's extra time. There's 70 years, and then it's extra time. And the settled reaction of God is revealed not only in the passing of time through our fingers, but in the reality of our guilt. Verse 8, you have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. Oh, here's the rub, isn't it? Here are the two great fears. The universal fear that underlies every fear is the fear of death. That's why the Bible addresses it. And accompanying that and adding power to its terror is our personal awareness of guilt, that we know ourselves to be guilty. We know that there are things we ought not to have done. We know that there are things we ought to have done. And judged by the standard of God's perfection, there's not a person, save God's own Son, Jesus, that stands guiltless before the bar of his testimony. And it is before that God that we will eventually stand. So the idea that my iniquities have been set before him and my secret sins are known in the light of his presence, either I'm going to have to reckon with that or I'm just going to have to do a cover-up. I'm going to have to do a Paul Simon on the whole project, right? This is 60 Sunday. Through the, through, you say, it's, it's always 60 Sunday with you. <laughs> through the corridors of sleep, past the shadows, dark and deep, my mind dances and leaps in confusion. I don't know what is real. I can't touch what I feel. And I hide behind the shield of my illusion. So, I'll continue to continue to pretend that my life will never end and that flowers never bend with the rainfall. Now, it rained yesterday. If you have any children of any age or size at all, they know that with sufficient force, flowers bend with the rainfall. To say that it isn't so is to deny reality. So I'll continue to continue to pretend that my life will never end. Why? Because it suits me. Woody Allen is the archetypal nihilist. I've said that to you before. Somebody gave me a wonderful quote from him just recently. This is what he says. I don't want to achieve immortality through my work. I want to achieve immortality through not dying. I don't want to live on in the hearts of my countrymen. I want to live on in my apartment. That's funny. But it's dead honest, isn't it? Why? Because he's got no answer. And because he knows he's guilty, whether he'll admit it to me or to you or not. But to himself, he must. And because he knows that death is coming for him. The Bible is so wonderfully clear. But here's the real question, isn't it? Verse 11, 
Who considers the power of your anger and your wrath according to the fear of you? In other words, who puts these two things together? By and large, people don't. People will say all kinds of things about death. Well, it's just inevitable, or it won't be there when, when it happens, or there's nothing to fear because there's nothing there. And so they'll say all kinds of things. Or they'll say, we're going to go on and on and forever and ever. But it's all an attempt to wrestle with the fact that we fail to put these things together, considering the power, the justifiable power of God's anger to punish sin, the, the right execution of his wrath against our rebellion and our indifference, and to say, golly, unless this same God before whom I stand condemned does something on my behalf, I've got no hope. That's what we've been studying in Ephesians. Isn't that what we sound? Paul says to the Ephesians, he says, remember that before you understood who Jesus is and what Jesus had done, you were like other people. You were without God, and you were without hope in the world. So, the psalm ends with just a, a string of requests, doesn't it? Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. It's a strange request, isn't it? Is, is, this, is this a request for mathematical ability? No. But it is estimated that 15,000 people died annually in the wilderness wanderings. 15,000 a year. So you've got 15,000 people dying since January 1 through the end of the year, and you need your leader to have a prayer, oh God, teach us to number our days aright. What, like you can't see 15,000 people dying? Yeah, but it happens all the time, doesn't it? You walk through the cemeteries like me. Do you say to yourself, I will never be here. This won't happen to me. You attended your friend's funerals. You went with the guys who got killed on the motorbike. You've gone through all of that stuff. And somehow or another, if you're not in Christ, you can just walk away from it again and again and again. It's like a child putting his fingers in his ears and his hands over his eyes. Na, 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 na. No, we'll be fine. Turn the radio up. Let's go get something to drink. It doesn't work. We need to be taught. Give me a heart of wisdom. What does that mean? Well, part of the nature of our rebellion against God is that we're, we just don't want to do this. Ecclesiastes 7. Someone who's always thinking about happiness is a fool. A wise person thinks about death. A wise person thinks about death. Teach us. Return, O Lord. How long? Have pity on your servants. You can imagine Moses there in the middle of all these wilderness wanderings. He's saying, you got us out of Egypt, and look at the mess we're in now. Could you come and do something again? In fact, when you read that quote, it's almost a direct quote from uh, Exodus 32. It is the context of the golden calf, remember? Lord, intervene on behalf of your people once again. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad all our days. Well, there's a shaving mirror verse if ever there was one, huh? There's one of your little things for your dashboard. It's a lovely verse, isn't it? But where does it come? What makes it so lovely? The background. We're brought to an end by your anger. You've set our iniquities before you. Our secret sins are known to you. Our life is ebbing away. Satisfy us. Satisfy us. Woody Allen again. Listen to this. this is, can you believe this is Woody Allen? There will be no solution to the suffering of mankind until we reach some understanding of who we are, what the purpose of creation was, what happens after death. Until these questions are resolved, we are caught. Absolutely true. I'd love to have the chance to share Psalm 90 with him, but he's not here, so I can only share it with you. What is this steadfast love? What is this covenant love of God? Where does it ultimately find its fulfillment? It all points right through 
to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. I wonder where you are in relationship to this this morning. I know some of you think, golly, you know, just because it's his birthday, he thinks he can lay this on us. It's, it's terrible. He's having his own personal crisis. Well, I may be having a crisis, but that's none of your business. I'm just telling you about Psalm 90 right now. You see, our death has been handled by the death of another. Our life is found in the life of another. Our destiny is before the throne of God to give an account. It is appointed unto man once to die. There ain't no second go around. And after that comes the judgment. And the story of Christianity is that God in Christ has entered into our death, into our rebellion, into our suffering, into our sin, and has taken upon himself these things so that those of us who turn from ourselves to embrace him as a Savior need not fear that day, but may rest in the provision of Jesus. Townend and Getty have done us a great favor, haven't they, with their songs? Jesus is Lord. The tomb is gloriously empty. Not even death could crush this king of love. The price is paid. The chains are loosed, and we are forgiven, and we can run into the arms of God. Have you ever run, as it were, into the arms of God? There's a wonderful picture there in Luke 15, isn't it, of the guy who's a complete wreck, a mess, overburdened by his sin, and he runs into the arms of God, represented as the Father. Well, you may be just a youngster today. Don't wait until you're old. Remember your Creator in the days of your youth before the time of trouble comes, before you become, before you're older, losing your hair many years from now, wondering if anyone will still send you a valentine, a birthday greetings, a bottle of wine, you know, that kind of thing. Now is the time. Now is always the time. Father, thank you for the insistence of your word. Thank you for the clarity of the Bible. Thank you that you confront us with these daunting and very clear statements concerning our own transience in order that we might discover all that is ours made available to us in your eternal Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We remember how he said to the sisters, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, even though he die, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me will never die. And then he said, do you believe this? Lord, uh, grant that we might answer, yes, Lord, I believe. Hear our prayers. Let our cry come to you. For Christ's sake. Amen. This message was brought to you from Truth For Life, where the learning is for living. To learn more about Truth For Life with Alistair Begg, visit us online at truthforlife.org.